What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top. Located at an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here are your hosts, Dr. Jeff Jarvis and Mike Burkest. Howdy, y'all. This is Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Have you ever used Reparadol? If you answered yes, congratulations, you're old. If, on the other hand, you answered, what the F is Reparadol? well, then you have been deprived of an amazing drug. More importantly, your patients have been deprived of a safe and effective therapy. Now, if you've listened to my prior podcast, you may have noticed that I really, really like this drug. We've covered some of the evidence for its effectiveness in headaches and agitation. Now, sadly, you may also have heard that I haven't been able to get it from my services or my emergency department, for that matter, for years. But a wonderful, wonderful thing happened this very week. We got our grubby paws on enough droperidol to last at least the next year. Now, because I am so excited about getting it back, I felt like doing an entire podcast that reviewed why we didn't have it in the first place. And then I'm going to finish up by describing how I'm going to be using it with my EMS agencies. Now, in case you don't know, droperidol or anapsine is a first-generation butrophenone antipsychotic medication similar to haloperidol. It's FDA-approved for treatment of post-operative nausea and vomiting at or below 2.5 milligrams IV or IM. Now, droperidol has been used extensively off-label around the world at doses up to 0.25 milligrams per kilogram for well over 40 years for a variety of indications, including nausea, vomiting, migraines, and agitation. Now, in the before times, life was good in emergency medicine. Droperidol was very effectively used, and it was used frequently. In one review article, 74 different peer-reviewed trials with more than 13,000 patients received droperidol, and that review found no cases of ventricular arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death. Well, then a bad thing happened. On December 4th, 2011, the FDA issued a black box warning. They said there had been reports of deaths associated with QT prolongation and torsades to point in patients treated with doses of droperidol above, within, and even below the approved range. Now, that was a quote from what they said. They went on and recommended ECG monitoring before the administration of droperidol and for two and a half hours after the administration as well as avoiding it altogether for anybody with prolonged QT on their ECG. That was a sad day. Now, in the after times, as in after the black box warning, life in emergency medicine was not as good. Many sad doctors, many sad paramedics, and most importantly, many sad patients. Many hospital formularies and EMS agencies removed droperidol. Other medications were substituted, though, even if they weren't as effective. So let me give you some examples. For nausea and vomiting, we used Ondansetron or Zofran. For um, agitation, we would use Haloperidol or Midazolam or even Ketamine. And then for headaches, we'd use Metoclopramide or Procloperazine. Now, ironically, some of these medications, including Ondansetron and Haloperidol, are also associated with QT prolongation 
or have other black box warnings. Now, since the rapid drop-off in droperidol use that resulted after those FDA warnings, it actually became unavailable because of back order. Now, early in 2019, a supplier started manufacturing it again. There were rays of sunshine on the horizon. And last week, I got my grubby, grubby paws on the droperidol. It's back, baby. So, with that in mind, should we use it? What should we make of the FDA's black box warning? Is the risk overstated? Well, to answer these questions, I'm going to do a very quick and abbreviated review of the literature and of the FDA's evidence for the black box warning. And then I'll end by telling you what I'm going to do in my systems. First, let's look at what the potential issue is. The FDA warning it's primarily concerned with QT prolongation and torsades. There have been quite a few articles published. Seriously, what I mean, quite a few, quite a few. You should PubMed this. It turns out that droperidol is a beloved drug by emergency physicians, by paramedics, by anesthesiologists. Nobody liked it when the FDA came in with this black box warning. A lot of people felt that it really was not justified and being the academic nerds that they are, they published. So really, take a look at some of these articles. Just in the bibliography at the end of this uh, podcast in the show notes, there are quite a few of them there. Well, some of these articles obtained the evidence that the F- uh, FDA used, and they got it through Freedom of Information request. Turns out that their evidence is based on 271 case reports between November of 1997 and December of 2001. These case reports came in through the FDA's MedWatch system. Now, this is a system, it's a great idea. It's a place where healthcare providers or the public or industry can report adverse events. And that's a good thing. We want to know what's going on with these drugs. The problem, though, is the FDA didn't make any attempt to verify what was in these reports. Once these uh, these articles, that looking at these reports, once they started looking at them, they found that there were quite a few duplicates, even triplicates, meaning the same case was reported multiple times by different people, and they were counted as unique patients. So after you remove those duplicates, those 271 reports turned out to be 93 unique patients. Quite a few of them were from foreign sources. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you look at where they came from, a lot of them were from Europe, and if you look at how droperidol was used in Europe, it was different than how it was used in the U.S. It was used at higher doses and even in oral preparations that were used for daily use. Now, 52 of the deaths that reported in these case studies involved doses greater than 10 milligrams. Some of them were in the 50 to 100 milligram range. 22 of them didn't have any doses at all. Now, that is, those are pretty big doses, 50 to 100 milligram range. To put that in perspective, the typical dose of droperidol for vomiting is two and a half milligrams. And even on the high end here in the U.S., the high dose is 10 milligrams for violent agitation. Well, one of the really interesting things, particularly for those of you who may have a tendency to listen to conspiracy theories, not that I ever would, of course, but interestingly, 71 of these adverse events and 55 deaths were all reported on the exact same day, and they were strongly suspected to be from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Now, Janssen at the time was the European distributor for droperidol, including the oral preparation, and they also happened to be the U.S. distributor for Risperdone. That's a drug that competed in the United States with droperidol in the antipsychotic market. The other thing that was weird about this is that the average time from the actual incident to that day when they reported, the average time was seven years. Now, the actual link to droperidol, in other words, the causation 
Did droperidol cause these events? Well, that was difficult to determine. Quite a few of these patients had multiple comorbid conditions or co-ingestions. As an example, there were patients who might have had other things going on other than agitation or nausea. For example, they were on in the ICU on a vasopressin, vasopressin or nitro drips for acute pulmonary edema. Maybe that wasn't their droperidol that did it. Kind of hard to tell. So it is probably an understatement to say that there's a fair amount of skepticism about the degree to which the FDA may have overstated the dangers of droperidol. Again, much of their justification was based on case reports. So what does the actual literature say? You know, the peer-reviewed stuff? Well, let's take a look at a couple of observational trials, including one that was published just this year. Dr. Cole and his colleagues published a retrospective observational study this year that reflects their experience with the droperidol back in the happy before times. They did a chart review of patients presenting to their urban emergency department between 97 and 2001. In other words, back when we had droperidol to give. They included anyone who received at least one dose of IV droperidol for any reason, whether it was nausea or vomiting, and had an ECG. Now, they reported on the QTC, and that's the corrected QT interval, and they calculated the incidence of torsades. There were over 16,000 patients who received over 18,000 doses of droperidol. They broke these patients into two groups based on their acuity, non-critical and critical. Of the 15,000-plus non-critical patients, 16% of them had ECGs and were open and available for review. And of the 1,100 criticals, 35% had ECGs. The bottom line is they didn't see any difference in the QTC interval in the ECGs that were obtained before giving droperidol and in the ECGs that were obtained after. They didn't see that in either group, the critical or the non-critical. Now, they also used a different technique, one that was not available when they were collecting the data. <clears throat> That's something called a QT nomogram, and that identifies those at risks for torsade because of uh, QT prolongation. It does some statistical methodology that gives you a better impact of the effective heart rate. Looking at that, they found 5% that were at risk before administration, 4% after. And most importantly, they only found one case of torsades. Now that one case, well, he was a cocaine stuffer. And remember, a cocaine stuffer is somebody who um, ingests condoms typically filled with cocaine. So it hangs out in his colon while um, the stuffer can get the cocaine from one place to another. Well, that stuffer came in, agitated, and got a single dose of droperidol for agitation. His torsades, it occurred 11 hours after getting the droperidol. Now, since the half-life for droperidol is about two hours, it's kind of unlikely that the torsades was caused by the droperidol. And one of the things that we know about cocaine is that it can actually cause QT prolongation also. But... Let's just assume that it was the droperidol. That translated to an incidence of torsades from droperidol of 1 in 16,546. Now, if you like that in percentages, that's 0.006%. That is a really small percentage. Well, let's take a look at another study. Doctors Calver and Isbester report on patients receiving droperidol as part of a prospective observational study in Australian emergency departments. Now, this study is unique because they were able to obtain high-quality, continuous 12-lead ECGs on patients that were getting droperidol for acute agitation. And they weren't getting small doses either. Their standardized protocol was 10 milligrams of droperidol IM every 10 minutes. Their primary outcome was the proportion of patients with an abnormal QTC. They got 43 patients, 29 of them 
received one uh, one 10 milligram dose. Another 11 got two 10 milligram doses, so 20 milligrams. Three got 30, and another three got 40 milligrams. 40 milligrams of droperidol. Now, of these 43, there are only four cases that had an abnormal QTC. And interestingly, they did not see a dose-response relationship. So one of the things we would like to see with a drug, if we're saying that it causes an abnormality, is that you would get more of the abnormality with higher doses. But they didn't see that. None of the patients with prolonged QT got either 30 or 40 milligrams. They were all in the 10 or 20 milligrams. Now, interestingly, three of those four patients had a normal QT interval until many hours after droperidol administration. And again, that suggests that the prolongation may not have been from the droperidol. But most importantly, in this study, there were no cases of torsades despite close and continuous monitoring. Now, one of the strongest pieces of evidence supporting the use of droperidol comes from one of my favorite papers. It's called A Randomized Control Trial of Intermuscular Droperidol versus Midazolam for Violence in Acute Behavioral Disturbance. And that's called the DORM study. This was another Australian study, again by doctors Isbester and Calver. They randomized 91 patients with acute undifferentiated agitation to get either droperidol 10 milligrams or midazolam 10 milligrams or a combination, DROP5 or Versed5. Now, apparently the Aussies do not mess around when it comes to sedating the unruling. Now, my Australian friends would tell me that's because they have a lot of experience with the unruly. Many of the unruly there were drunk, and it turns out that alcohol intoxication was one of the primary reasons that people were highly agitated and got sedated. Okay, so again, three groups, droperidol 10, droperidol, I'm sorry, droperidol 10, droperidol 5, plus Versed 5, or Versed 5. Now, it's important to note there aren't a whole lot of people who are recommending using 10 milligrams of IM Versed for agitation. We're usually using some homeopathic dose of around 2.5 milligrams of Versed. So the results they're going to see here I don't think were or can be extrapolated to what we typically do. Now, the primary outcome of this study was the duration of violent behavior, and that was defined as the length of time the security guard had to stay outside the room. Now, I think that likely overestimates how long it actually takes to get behavioral control. So what did they find? No significant differences between the groups. What did they uh, Specifically, they saw 20 minutes for the 10 of Draperidol, 24 minutes for the 10 of Versed, and 25 for the combination. They did, however, find a need for more sedation and more adverse events in the Versed group. To our particular point about the adverse events, no more QT prolongation with droperidol than with Versed, which is interesting because Versed doesn't have any known effect on the QT interval. So what we have here is a drug that effectively became unavailable after decades of safe use because of poor quality case reports of adverse events. Now, since the FDA black box warning, there's been literature again confirming the very low incidence of QT prolongation and the more clinically relevant torsades. This would strongly suggest that using droperidol, particularly the doses used in the U.S., is safe and effective. Now, my two agencies used droperidol a lot when it was available, and we had really good success with it. I even left it in our protocols for several years after it became unobtainium. I was doing it maybe just as an offering to the EMS supply gods, hoping that they would favor us with its return. And now it appears that they have. We can get it again, and damn it, I am putting it back in our protocols. So how am I using it? Well, there are a couple of areas. Number one, I'm going to use it for nausea and vomiting for patients that are refractory to Zofran. Those folks will get 2.5 milligrams IV or IM every 10 minutes as long as they need it. For migraines, I'll tell you, this is probably my favorite drug for migraines. 
that we're going to use two and a half milligrams IV or IM repeated once at one uh, and a quarter milligram, 1.25 milligrams. I still think droperidol is the single best drug for migraines. Now, for agitation or psychosis, these are the patients that we were giving haloperidol for. So they're agitated, but they're not quite being like, uh, like Neo in the Matrix where he's flinging agents left and right. These are the, the mildly pissed off, pissed off enough that you can't reason with them, but not actually a physical danger. Here, I'm going to give five of IM uh, droperidol repeated at two and a half. And again, this is the group that I would have given Haldol to. And then for our really out of control, violent agitation, these are patients in immediate danger of hurting themselves, hurting others. I'm going to do 10 milligrams I am. I'm going full Aussie. 10 milligrams repeated at five. And okay, so maybe I'll go partial Aussie uh, and back it down just a little bit. What am I going to do about 12-lead ECGs? Well, we are going to get a 12-lead as soon as it is safely possible for doses above 2.5. So for our nausea, vomiting, getting 2.5, we're not going to require it. Now, even though I'm going to leave some alternatives in place, my hope is that we're going to use less of those drugs. Again, we were using metoclopramide for migraines and nausea. Hopefully, we won't be using any. We were using haloperidol for agitation. Hopefully, we won't be using, weren't, will not be using any. And then finally, we use ketamine. Now, this indication we're using ketamine for our violent, dangerous patients. I think that there is probably some of those patients that we can probably safely use droperidol for. My main hope right now is that we can keep our hands on droperidol. Let's just hope that it stays available. Now, just because this is a literature-based podcast, I'm going to include a brief bibliography in the show notes. Well, guys, as always, thank you for listening. Mike and I would love your feedback. You can reach us by email at jeff.jarvis at flightbridgeed.com. That's two E's. Or you can get Mike at mikeverkest at flightbridgeed.com. And I'm sorry, that's mike.verkest. Or you can hit us on Twitter. I am at Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and he is at Mike Verkest. Again, thanks for listening. Take care, y'all. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.